Grace and mercy and peace are yours through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So this scene from John chapter 9 that we we just read a a second ago, it it does require a little bit of context here. Uh, Jesus is standing in the temple in Jerusalem, and he is teaching a a group of people there in the the temple. Uh, And they're having kind of an extensive conversation. John chapter 8 is a fairly long chapter. So here's the, the Spark Notes version. Do people still use Spark Notes? You know what that is? It's a summary. Uh, here's the summary of John chapter 8. Jesus is making clear to the, the people that he has come from the Father, that, that he came from heaven, right? That he is the eternal God. That's what he was alluding to this, this whole time. And, and, and so in John chapter 8, he says, because I have come from the Father, and because it's not just my testimony, but the Father's testimony that I'm bringing, you can trust that my testimony, what I'm saying to you, it's valid and certain. You can trust it. It has a heavenly source. Um, some people believe this. Uh, others didn't. Some people put their faith in him. Uh, some people kind of liked what he was saying but didn't quite put their faith in him. And some just rejected him altogether. I- I'm going to guess that if you went home today, and maybe I'll challenge you to do that, um, between basketball games today, uh, go home and read John chapter 8. And I'm going to guess it's going to take you not too long before you're kind of frustrated with the people that were listening to Jesus. Because he could hardly be saying things any clearer. You start reading a little bit of John chapter 8 and you start thinking, how could they not get it? It seems so obvious. Man, wouldn't we just love if Jesus was standing right before us? We could see him, we could touch him. They could do both of those things and yet they did not believe. Well, This conversation leads to its kind of inevitable conclusion. Jesus has been hinting it at it. He's been building up to it. And he essentially says it as plainly as he ever has, I am the eternal God. That's what he says. Now, there's a bunch of Pharisees there listening to him, and and you could probably guess how they felt about that statement. This is blasphemy. They were outraged. They they, they started picking up stones that they could find to throw at him because they wanted to stone him to death. For this great blasphemy, and we're told at the end of John chapter 8 that whether it was miraculous or or he just was kind of sneaky, he was able to slip out of that crowd. So he slips out of the temple, he's walking out of the temple grounds, and he walks by a man who is physically blind. He had just left a group of people who were spiritually blind. They could physically see, but they were spiritually blind. And now he walks by a man who is actually physically blind. Like, he can't see anything, and he's been that way since the day that he was born. That kind of leads into our our section from John chapter 9 today, uh, where we're going to see that that Jesus uses a, a, a physical demonstration to reveal a spiritual reality. Now, uh, if you didn't know who Jesus was, if you didn't know that he was the, the son of God, the eternal God, as he just said, you might attribute him walking by this man blind from birth. You might say it's a coincidence or an accident. But you know Jesus well enough to know that nothing he does is a coincidence or an accident. He is in the exact place he needs to be at that time. He says the exact thing that he needs to say at that time. And so it is no accident No coincidence that he walks by this man who was blind from birth. He has a reason and purpose for doing so. And he's going to tell us what that is. But first, the disciples have a question. They say, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You see, the disciples, they saw this man and they they kind of jumped to a conclusion. They saw his disability and they said, well, someone must have sinned for him to be like that. It must have been a sin of his, or maybe his parents had done something to cause this. And before we're too hard on the the disciples, they're they're really just trying to make sense of what they see, right? They're they're making observations. They're saying, this man is blind, and we're not. So there's got to be a difference between this guy and us. So so what's that that difference? And they reason that, that maybe it was sin that caused this, his sin or his parents' sin that caused this. The disciples are reacting to what they can see, but here's the thing. The disciples can't see everything that is going on. They're blind to certain things. 
And you can hardly blame the disciples. This is kind of an ordinary reaction. Maybe you've read this section a few times. I've read this section a few times, and, and I'll, I'll admit to you that, that sometimes my knee-jerk reaction is, ah, I don't think like that, right? But the more you meditate on, on this, the, the more you think, yeah, that's, that's a real thought that, that I deal with in my head. Did my sin cause this? Is, is God trying to, to punish me? When some sort of hardship or affliction comes into your life, um, you react a lot of times like the disciples reacted. It's really easy to react that way. And it might sound like this. Uh, something bad happens to you, and, and you immediately think of how you acted last week. Uh, you, you were kind of bitter and angry last week. And, and so it just makes sense that, that God is kind of evening the score this week by sending this affliction, by sending this hardship, right? Have you thought that before? Or uh, maybe it's something that you feel really, really guilty about. And it could have happened not too long ago, but it may have happened a long, long time ago. And you, you still feel pretty guilty about it. And so when this hardship or affliction comes into your life, where does your mind jump immediately? God's evening the score. He's getting back at me for that thing that I feel really guilty about way back when. We think this all the time. This is a, a real thought that goes through the head of, of parents who, whose children have some sort of health disability. Did we do something to cause this? Is God punishing us uh, and using our child to, to do that? They may not say it out loud, but they, they think it in their head. We have real thoughts like this. When affliction comes and hardship comes, we assume that we know why. But God just doesn't work like that. And you know how you know? Because you do know. Just, just look at the cross. What did we deserve? And what did God do for us? He didn't give us what we deserve. He didn't punish us. But he gave Jesus what we deserved. He punished Jesus for us. If ever you're thinking that, that God is somehow punishing you for, for something that you did in the past, look at the cross and, and know deep in your heart that God has already punished Jesus for everything um, that we could ever do, past, present, and, and future. Through this awful cross, through this physical act that Jesus carried out on the cross, it communicates a spiritual reality to us. That spiritual reality is that we are, are saved. That spiritual reality is also that, that through suffering and through hardship, God can bring about great blessings. There's, there was probably no one that suffered more than Jesus did on the cross. And through his suffering came wonderful blessings. So could a Christian view that hardship or affliction differently? Rather than thinking, okay, this is a punishment from God, maybe a Christian might look at hardship and affliction and think, what sort of blessing could God be working through this hardship or affliction? Or when, when hardship or affliction comes, could you think, might this be an opportunity for the works of God to be revealed? That's what Jesus said, right? Uh, so the disciples gave him two options, A or B, either he sinned or his parents sinned. Jesus opted for neither of them. He took, he took C, as he often does in the Gospels. And he says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but there was a reason. There was a reason. Why, why Jesus walked by this man, why it was not a coincidence. There was a reason why this man was born blind. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. In case anyone wondered, in case anyone wondered what God could do, he's going to give a testimony of that through this, this blind man. Um, Jesus does this all the time. He, he has done it and he will continue to do it. So, Jesus, he spits on the ground, he makes some saliva, or he spits his saliva, sorry, he makes some mud, picks up the mud, puts it on the guy's eyes, and tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. This was like the, the community pool here. Now, e even though this, this man has, has probably gone through a lot of, of things that no one else had gone through in his life, this was still strange, right? A guy's putting mud on my eyes, but really at this point, what does he have to lose? So he gets up and he goes to the pool and he washes and he can see. He says he came back seeing. 
Now, I don't think any of us can probably fully understand what that was like for that guy. He's never seen anything in his entire life. He's only ever been darkness. And now Jesus has turned the lights on for him. He, he can see the water that he just put on his face. He, he can see people for the, the first time. He can see buildings and trees and birds, things that he couldn't really even conceptualize in his head. He probably had all these pictures of, of what he thought things looked like, and now, oh, now I can see them with my eyes. And so to say that he was excited, that's, that's probably the, the understatement of all understatements. Jesus had done for him what no other person could do. He had made the blind see. So word obviously spreads about this really quickly. This guy who everyone knew in that community that, that he had been blind for as long as they'd ever known him, and now they see him up walking around, he can see things, he's doing things that he hadn't done before. This is the kind of thing that, that would spread quickly and a commotion would start to, to brew here as people learned about this and trying to figure out who this guy was that, that did this. And so some of the people saw that commotion starting to happen. They, they grabbed this guy and they brought him to the Pharisees so that the Pharisees could question him. Now, Pharisees are, are obviously pretty skeptical of, of all of this. And so they ask him, how did this all happen? How, how, did you, how did you get healed? How do you have your sight now? Uh, I, here's how I picture the, the blind man. He, he may know the Pharisees' game a bit. He may know why they're asking him these questions, but he's just so excited that, that he, can't, he can't hold that story in, right? He's going to tell that story probably millions of times for the rest of his life, and he'll probably tell it with the same amount of enthusiasm. Well, this guy put mud on my eyes, and then he told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam, and then I did, and now... I can see things. And he probably didn't leave out even one detail in that whole story to, to the Pharisees. But, but you know what detail the, the Pharisees pulled out of that story? Jesus healed. And what day was it? It was the Sabbath. Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Healing is work. And you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. So Jesus is guilty of breaking the Sabbath. These guys are failing to see this miracle for what it was. This is miraculous. Jesus had changed this guy's life for the rest of his life. His life would never be the same. This was an amazing blessing. And rather than them being happy for him and giving thanks with him, they're bringing accusations to Jesus. So let's, let's do the math here. You heard a little bit of the context in John chapter 8. Jesus says in John chapter 8 that he has come from the Father in heaven. Uh, he says that his, his testimony is valid and certain and that he is the eternal God. Okay, That's chapter 8. Now add to that chapter 9. He does something that only God can do. I'll put those two together. What's the conclusion? He is who he said he is. He is from the Father. He is the eternal God. But as obvious as that might seem to you and me, the Pharisees are blind to it. They, they can't see what is right in front of their faces, which is really what blindness is, right? If you're blind, you can't see anything. Even if it's right in front of your face, you can't see it. Even if it is so obvious, you can't see it. These Pharisees were spiritually blind. They could physically see, but they spiritually couldn't see what, was, what is so obvious to everyone else. That's exactly how you and I were born, congenitally, spiritually blind. Spiritually, we are unable to see things as they actually are. Spiritually, we are unable to see God in the way we were born. We can't see things right in front of our, our faces. We are born with the blindness of unbelief. Now, if you've been in the church for a while, you've heard that, right? You've heard that. Uh, and it's something we understand, we can understand here. It's something we often fail to appreciate or to, to think about here. We don't feel it here sometimes because for a lot of us, maybe that was a long time ago, right? Maybe you don't even remember that time because you were just a little baby when you were brought to the, to the waters of baptism here. So, so you don't remember that time when you were blind, so it's pretty hard to feel that, Feel the weight of that original sin. I don't know exactly how to make you feel it uh, because I don't know how to make myself feel it sometimes except to say it maybe just a little stronger and just really let it sink in for a second. 
when you and I were born, our eternal address was hell. That's what we deserved. All of God's wrath, all of God's punishment, we were blind. We, we couldn't see a thing. Just, just let that sink in for a second. Because the better we know that, the better we understand that, the more we feel that, the more we can know, understand, and feel the weight of what Jesus did for us, the more we can understand the gospel. Because in our text, Jesus makes spiritual realities known through a physical demonstration. He didn't walk by a man blind from birth on accident. He could have walked by a blind guy that had been blind for two years. He used to be able to see, but now he was blind. He could have walked by a guy that was, you know, he, he could kind of see. He wasn't completely blind. He could see, like, shapes and stuff. He could have walked by a guy like that, but, but he walked by a guy who was blind from birth. And he did what no one else could do. Made that guy who was blind from birth able to see just like he does for us. Takes someone who was spiritually blind from birth and gives them eyes of faith to see. This man getting his physical sight back was only the the second greatest miracle in this whole section. The, The greatest miracle happened at the end, right? Where this man comes back to Jesus after being thrown out of the presence of the Pharisees, right? They're done with him. He goes to to Jesus, and Jesus says, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Tell me who he is so I can believe in him. Well, the one speaking to you, that's the Son of Man. I believe. And he worshiped. That was the greatest miracle. Faith was created in that man's heart. He could now see, and his eternal address had been changed from hell to heaven. Wouldn't it be awesome if we had a physical demonstration to communicate a spiritual reality for us. We don't, have the, we don't have the pool of Siloam. I don't have the waters from the pool of Siloam for you. Um, but God has given you something even better than that because he has given you two physical things that communicate, and they do more than just communicate a spiritual reality. They, they actually give it to you at, at your baptism, right? This earthy, real thing that you can see and that you can touch, you can witness, that you can remember. He gave that to you so that, that you could know. So, so you can know here and you can know here what Jesus has done for you. So that you could, could have this physical demonstration give you this spiritual blessing. And then what we'll celebrate today. The Lord's Supper, because it wasn't enough for him to tell you so so that you just hear that you're forgiven. That that would have been enough. He could have just told us. But instead, he wants you to taste forgiveness on your lips so that you remember. He, He wants these physical acts to announce to you that you are saved, that you are forgiven, and that heaven is your eternal address. May God give us eyes of faith always. Those eyes wide open to see all of the blessings that he intends to pour out on us, not only through suffering and affliction, but through his word and through his sacrament. Amen.